David Rossi of Generation Z. Welcome to Nature of Reality Radio. You seem like a very, very interesting guest. Of course, I felt that about you after I saw you on some program. I don't remember exactly which program it was, but whatever it was, I loved what I heard so much. I decided to reach out to you in this little bio you sent me. It says you're the founder of SAL, excuse me, SAALT LLC, a company focused on providing solutions to various elements of consciousness, zero point energy, um, propulsion, medical benefits, and much more. So, um, I guess we'll get into that first, um, and uh, and then after that, whenever when you're finished with that, I guess I can use uh, your web your YouTube channel as a guide to pick some projects that I uh, some topics and such that I feel are worth discussing in greater detail. There's a whole slew of things, but we're pressed for time, so let's just pick some important stuff here. And without uh, Further ado, why don't you, um, well, first of all, explain who you are, what you experience from a primary source perspective that caused you to do the stuff that you do, and then, I guess, get into your um, SALT LLC company, if that's not what you call it, um, and uh, what, how, how you're, where you're planning to go with that, and uh, what it's done so far, and what you see for the future of it. So you got the floor. I don't have Alex Jones-itis. I don't interrupt my guests. So knock yourself out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, first off, Andrew, it's, it's an honor and it's a pleasure to be here. And I really do appreciate you reaching out to begin with. Um, any any time that I have the uh, possibility or capability to uh, speak and at least, um, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, preach my personal objective and experience and understanding of all of this to a new audience, I'm truly humbled and honored. Now, before I start, uh, before I even introduce myself, let me just say with the utmost kindness and humil humility, excuse me, to you and your audience that with everything I'm about to state here in this entire conversation, I'm not asking people to believe me. I am simply asking people to be open to this type of possibility and information. So without further ado, uh, my name, my real name is David Rossi. I've gone publicly last couple of years um, running a podcast called the Generation Z uh, podcast as David Z um, as sort of a, a way to explore ideas, not necessarily say what is right or wrong, but to sort of perhaps take a perspective that what we call disagreements, whether in science, whether in make, even politics, if you will, may in fact be different perspectives of the same, if you will, information structure at both a physical and a physics perspective and a, and a metaphysical level. So a couple of years back when um, the, 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 the pandemic started, I was working just, you know, normal nine to five construction job and all of this. And all of a sudden, I did have a month or two uh, of time off, as did most other people with respect to when everyone was, you know, self-isolating and all of this. And so I decided to start a podcast. And long story short, what happened was essentially, I didn't intend to start it about anything scientific. As a matter of fact, to be honest with you uh, and your audience, I just tried to essentially either, I guess you could say, emulate Joe Rogan. And so I was just doing talking into a black screen, no video. If I got maybe 10 views or listens, you know, eight out of the 10 being my mother, I would be happy, right? And so one day out of nowhere, uh, I, I decided to say to myself, you know, let's do a, an episode on Project B uh, Bluebeam. Um, and so it got like almost 5,000 views with zero promotion. I had no social media or any of this. And then I said, okay, well, clearly got almost 5,000, you know, listens, views or whatever, and everything else is getting no more than 10 views. So there's something there. I then did another episode on Operation Paperclip. It got like 1,500 views. And so I said, okay, this is something that perhaps I can delve into, but what can I do differently if I were to enter the paranormal, high strangeness, uh, UFO, UAP community that others have not done? And that's no disrespect to anyone else. So what I started doing was, again, uh, opening and exploring albeit there are different channels that do this as well now to be fair, but at the time, just ideas, just the theories, whether theoretical, whether in an application-based sense, you name it. And I sort of use the show as both a teaching and learning guide, both for myself and for the audience as well. And then, you know, a couple of years fast forward as I'm just running the show, doing my thing about this time last year, as of the day uh, you and I, Andrew, are having this conversation, I said to myself, you know what? I think I've put together via open source research, including, to be fair as well, dark web research on how potentially one could crack what's been generally known, although I don't like to call it that now that I understand it more so, um, anti-gravity or anti-gravitic technologies. So what I did was I just used uh, some open source information, a little bit of intuition, a little bit of 
honestly just experimentation in a, in a backyard and things like this. And um, on, uh, by complete coincidence, after multiple attempts at uh, certain uh, forms of experimentation with no more than $2,000 spent at the local hardware store and some other places. Um, I, I created what one would call perhaps an anti-gravitic phenomenon. But now I, again, to be clear as well, from a scientific perspective, this was not in a closed laboratory setting. One could very easily play devil's advocate and say, well, maybe it was the wind or maybe it was this or that, that got a particular object to go prop, not just levitating, but to go propagating and flying, if you will. Um, or taking off from this this little generator that I had built. And so I said to myself, all right, let's not get ahead of myself. Let's try it in different methods, means, ways, and all of this. And as I'm doing this simultaneously, I'm starting to slowly get emails via my show, my podcast email from people in military intelligence. And these are people with, I mean, you can't deny their credibility. You look at their email. These are professors at certain universities of which I'm, I'm still um, in uh, correspondence with them now. So I, I probably won't get into detail in that regard. But long story short, I then started with discussion with such professors with uh, the attempt at self-learning via the show and in private. I then started to try and essentially self-teach um, a combination of I know this is a bold claim or statement, but I said, you know, F it, why not? Uh, the particle physics, electrical engineering, optics, chemistry, and a couple other things. And what I found was, was that it seemed as though the quote unquote answer, if you will, to cracking a lot of this technology and um, it, it, that it has to encompass the vast majority of what we call STEM science, technology, engineering, mathematics. If one, for example, is simply an electrical engineer or a ceramics engineer, they do have one piece of how this stuff works, um, believe it or not. And uh, some of it is, in fact, in the academic literature. A lot of it is, in fact, restricted because it's, it gets a little bit, dare I say, um, for lack of a better term, suppressed and muddied from there. But if one has even a general understanding, in my humble opinion, in optics, chemistry, uh, particle physics, electrical engineering, one can, in fact, unify that and then perhaps take a perspective that's been outside of the traditional domain of academia and apply it in an engineering sense and perhaps make various forms of what we would call, um, you know, what Jack Sarfati has called EVO, exotic vacuum objects, what Dr. Salvatore Paez, the UFO Navy patent gentleman, has called uh, the superforce, what Dr. Halpudov has called zero point. Um, one can tap this energy in a variety of different ways, which is why I also claim that I have not found the way. There are multiple ways to access this energy, believe it or not, whether with moving parts or non-moving parts in more geometrical arrangement. But ultimately, I'm not claiming I found the way or the set of ways. I'm simply claiming I um, found a set of ways. And so since then, I continued the experimentation. Uh, then I implemented, you know, old microwaves, things like this into what I just simply call the generator made a few different variations of it had there was a military base at where i was staying at the time probably about you know 40 minutes an hour down the road uh from where i was and some jets were starting to fly over and things like this and that's when i realized that this what we would call this anti-gravitic or you know it, i guess you could say zero point energy or whatever one wants to call it does in fact whenever someone develops a device that enables this it does, in fact, turn on, I guess you could say, certain alarms or uh, rate, it alerts certain radars that world governments, uh, in my humble perspective, do indeed have. And so this is not necessarily a bad thing per se, but one thing that I found was that, and one of the reasons that I believe that a lot of this stuff is being so suppressed is because, um, and this can be substantiated uh, within the known laws of physics, uh, actually within laws of physics, not necessarily known per se, but the, in the general sense, but whether it's on the theoretical side um, of particle physics, electrical engineering, electronics engineering, or whether it's on the application-based side and, you know, actually applying it in a laboratory. When one cracks what's been called anti-gravity, one essentially enables with some slight adjustments to their device or apparatus, they then crack the rest. Now, what do I mean by the rest? This is where it starts to get into a little bit of, woo, uh, I guess you could say, woo-woo land for some people. But I will say that, albeit I can't substantiate it in a public regard, because that's when I have to fortunately draw the line, um, hence why I started the company that I did, this can be scientifically substantiated. So what do I mean by that? When one cracks anti-gravity, you essentially, with some slight adjustments, have the capability to open miniature, dare I say, portals or stargates. Um, 
it does harness in many cases the plasma energy as some people as some you know professors have come out and recently acknowledged um, one also enables the capability for what I would like to call organic telekinesis if you will which we could call perhaps intuition um, and what I mean by organic is no need for a chip in the brain type situation and so after this I spent many months understanding the science more and then essentially I got um, I, I I essentially got for lack of a better term, brought in uh, within certain elements of the Pentagon and the Department of Defense. And I did not want to limit myself because I do believe that, unfortunately, um, a lot of this tech can be weaponized very easily. And, if, and, and a good chunk of people, in my humble view, have anywhere from 40 to 70 percent of the necessary materials to create such a device in their own home. I understand why this is to a large degree an issue because it puts, you know, guns and things out of business. So, you know, terrorists that get a hold of it, uh, it, it does create a problem. But with that said, I don't think that should be a reason that this stuff should, st should not be revealed either. So that was why essentially I started SALT. SALT stands for Strategic Analysis and Assessment of Longitudinal Technologies, because essentially what I did was I didn't want to go under NDA under any other department or company. I basically NDA'd myself. And I know that might sound ridiculous, but from a, I guess you could say, internal strategic standpoint, it's the best that I could do while being able to speak publicly while also not getting disappeared at the same time. So I, I know these are bold claims. Um, I've, I've spoken with, uh, I've made various presentations to different world governments, um, as well as private uh, groups as well, that are quite familiar with how this technology can be tapped or how this energy can be tapped rather, and the different means of doing so. So forgive me for the ramble, but that's essentially how this all came to be in a nutshell. Thank you. That was a <clears throat> very enlightening, interesting uh, way to start off this interview. Um, well, you seem to be um, really into conspiracies and all and such. Uh, uh, before, I, well, I try to move on from that to some degree. Um, the conspiracy field, it's not such a bad thing. You always want to be on a quest for truth. But um, in this, uh, it, it's kind of one of those things that once you um, are really into it for a while, you kind of need to, to move on to some other things, more spiritual stuff, I feel like. Uh, like I agree. So you can listen to Alex Jones all the time, but if once you've uh, woken up enough, then maybe you can only listen to Alex Jones for the sake of getting your news headlines every single day and then spend the rest of the time learning other more higher level stuff. No offense to Alex Jones, but he's more I, I, part, so if you know what I mean. So I agree. I, I actually, As a matter of fact, I don't mean to cut you off, sir, but um, it's, uh, that's actually where I'm at as well. I spend most of my time now uh, trying to you know, uh, attain contracts for the company I started as well as uh, sifting through the academic literature from the 1800s all the way to today. Um, I'm not necessarily so concerned in who's doing what or how. I've selected a few different areas I'd like to focus on, which is, again, consciousness and propulsion, and um, that's where I've gone. So I, I, I agree, yes. Yes. Um, now, although there is one little conspiracy that's, uh, well, <laughs> is it a conspiracy? Nobody seems to have made a conspiracy out of it yet, but... I've just noticed a few things myself, and it's funny. Um, you uh, say you call yourself Generation Z. Are are you actually from gen what Generation Z would refer to itself as? The people born in that time period. Out of curiosity, is that where that comes from? Sure. Yeah, I was I, I was born in 1998, so I'm 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 24 years old. All right, I am of the Generation Y um, variety. And, um, well, very prominent member of Generation Y just uh, passed away, Jason David Frank, the guy who paid the uh, uh, Green and White Power Ranger from the 90s. He was a guy that almost every girl in my generation had a, a crush on <laughs> growing up. Um, right. <laughs> interestingly, how I right. watched, I actually watched the uh, Power Rangers movie from 2017, the remake, last week perfect timing he um because he and amy joe johnson who played the pink power ranger and was someone all the boys of my generation had a crush on growing up actually make a cameo at the end of that movie. Right. interesting thing about jason david frank though um he was about to um well there was about about to be a movie release that he was a prominent role in. he played actually the leading role i think in that movie the there was the movie's legends of the white dragon and there was a 
a little video on the Looper YouTube channel uploaded yesterday saying that movie may never get released. But what's interesting is I saw what the, in the title, White Dragon, immediately after I saw that, I thought Benjamin Fulford, <laughs> the guy who talks about white dragon societies all the time. And they say that Jason David Frank right. died of suicide, but I'm not buying that for one moment. He, they, everybody said he was a great human being. And what, what reason would he possibly have to want to commit suicide at the relatively middle-aged, young age of, well, young, whatever, not 49. He was 49. And why would he need to commit suicide? Right. Yeah. Well, is it possible that that White Dragon movie, he, you know, celebrities sometimes get killed because they don't want to be part of the system anymore? Makes you wonder, was he killed because he was not yep. being part of the system anymore? And was his White Dragon movie, If will we ever see it? Well, somebody who sees that say this is kind of like disclosure uh, under the guise of fiction. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm only asking questions here, but I don't know. I'm throwing this out for people to make sense of. Do you Actually, I can uh, – well, what I can tell you, Andrew, is that uh, – to be honest with you, sir, um, the – I will say that there is a very heavy military intelligence presence within Hollywood and, and almost every uh, industry, if you will. A lot of people think, for example, you know, the intelligence uh, world is layered atop the normal world. As a matter of fact, I would dare to say uh, humbly and unfortunately, it's the opposite, where, for as a matter of fact, the, uh, the quote unquote normal world has been layered atop or over top the intelligence methods and uh, apparatuses used. Now, to specify more to your question, Unfortunately, I, I don't know enough about the case to speak on that particular individual, but what I can say about this in general is that this same energy that I just discussed that you graciously let me speak on at the beginning of this show, um, the same energy that in which pro pro allows for propulsion, as the former 60 Minutes journalist Ross Coulthard said on a show just last night, um, is even according to his sources, which I would agree with as well is the same type of energy that can induce what publicly people know as Havana syndrome, direct energy weapons, psychotronic influence, and things like this. So it can be, uh, I do have to watch my words here, but it can be scientifically calculated and substantiated that such energies, devices, and technologies, and uh, even more so organic sciences and energies can in fact induce such. I mean, we see, for example, a leak from the uh, Washington D.C. Fusion Center from a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, uh, some a couple some years back, that showed that, for example, uh, psychotronic influence uh, with respect to uh, radio frequencies uh, could be induced via satellites, could be induced via the cell phone to a targeted a TI, a targeted individual, and depending on the, the frequency induced and which part of the body that frequency is then pointed at and towards, it can in indeed induce a state of uncontrollable physical action or having thoughts being put into in one's head. As a matter of fact, um, I, I discussed this even on my show to the extent that I can. I stumbled, well, stumbled, I say that, you know, wink, wink, 297 slides out of um, uh, the Department of Defense from back in the early 90s on how a lot of this technology does indeed work. It's the same type of technology that may or may not be able to cure cancers. It, you know, I say may or may not be because, you know, to your audience, respectfully, you could read between the lines there. Um, it's the same underlying energy. It's not just propulsion oriented. Essentially, one can, for lack of a better term, manipulate this energy to do what, to whether heal or cure someone or to, in fact, induce a suicidal episode in them. So in other words, I will say that within both, in some cases, the public literature of academia in optics, particle physics, um, even uh, the, more so uh, even neurology of the brain and things like this, in addition to a lot of the restricted literature that resides on uh, DOD servers, um, it can be done, uh, unfortunately. But this is why this also goes back to the idea of, again, if it's so accessible within the house of every person, it becomes a tool. One person may use it genuinely for good, but all it takes is one guy to get, you know, or a girl to get ticked off that their ex broke up with them, and now they've made a particle beam weapon. So, um, I, in other words, short answer, in my opinion, yes. It, it can be scientifically substantiated and, and conducted, and in fact, I would dare to say it has been for many decades now, uh, to induce such, such behaviors in people. Okay, and since you mentioned... Um direct energy um 
I just mentioned Benjamin Fulford with the whole White Dragon Society thing. There's another thing um, Benjamin Fulford um, recently said that um, I think may um, open a few eyes. That kind of, I guess this would pertain to your work with conspiracies and direct energy and all. He actually said that uh, Queen Elizabeth did not die of natural causes. She was actually murdered by a direct energy death ray. And he also said that the wizard behind the curtain who had the direct energy death ray fired upon Elizabeth to kill her, was none other than Henry Kissinger. Well, could it be? Well, I can imagine it, it doesn't seem so far-fetched. I mean, uh, Henry Kissinger and Queen Elizabeth would, would be the de facto um, emperor and empress of, palp of planet Earth, if you will, in regards to who is the king head honcho of the... New World Order agenda, or what remains of it. <laughs> Everybody says, "Don't worry about the New World Order anymore. They're kaput. They're not, they're done for. They can't. They're going to lose more and more power every day." Well, that may be true, but they are so arrogant and so, so, um, so like determined to uh, keep trying to further, even if uh, they know they're going to lose, that they're probably going to continue to keep um, fighting on and on. So anybody who says Henry Kissinger is sitting in a rocking chair waiting to die any day now, <laughs> don't try to downplay it. He's probably doing no such thing. He has been um, for decades fighting a New World Order agenda, and I'm sure he intends to keep fighting that agenda till it um, till he falls down dead and uh, and he's, uh, he wants to die a happy man, and he's not going to be able to die a happy man if he had to surrender and give up the New World Order that he's been fighting for for so many years. But he may realize that um, he's uh, got some, the people that, it, that were his allies in the New World Order are at the same time his enemies. The, the New World Order, they're so evil, they hate each other as much as they hate humanity. Could it be that Henry Kissinger, seeing maybe Elizabeth as his um, top uh, threat to being able to be the like number one true leader of the New World Order, decided to just kill her? I mean, she uh, could claim that she was more powerful than him from a wealth standpoint. Anyway, I mean, um, it, she's even more wealth. She was even more wealthy than Elon Musk in terms of the value of both the money she owed and the value of all the property she owed. She would be would have been the richest person in the world, actually. But well, she's dead now, and I don't know what um, how much of the wealth was transferred to King Charles. But uh, the idea that Kissinger would have killed her with a direct energy death ray. You know, so he could be the one that rides the New World Order horse till it falls down dead and claimed he was the one that led it. Like Benjamin Fulford says, do you have anything to say about this? In this regard, um, I, I don't mean to be, forgive me if for sounding stingy if I do here with respect to, again, uh, scientifically, everything that you claimed as, as you know, quote unquote, outrageous or quote unquote, sensational as it may seem to others. It, it, it has, in my humble perspective, it, it can be indeed be done in a scientific regard. Now, with respect to the background politics as to who wanted who taken out or something like this, I don't know specifics, but all I do know is that there is currently, as we speak, a paradigm shift, uh, internal power struggle amongst various factions of both, dare I say, human and even non-human uh, groups, some with benevolent interests, some with malevolent ones. Um, and it, this is this is where it goes into the I'm not I, I don't want to speak on things that I genuinely don't know about. But I mean, listen, everything that you had said there in that regard from a part, you know, from a, a weapon standpoint, from a technological standpoint, can in fact be scientifically calculated, substantiated and, and accounted for um, and has been so, in my humble opinion, for many decades. Uh, with respect to, again, the specificities and the granularities of the internal conflicts between, for example, Kissinger and, and uh, Queen Elizabeth II, that is, uh, I don't rule anything out to be fair, but that's as up in the air for myself as it is for anybody else. Yes, yes. Um, now let's get on to some of the um, things that um, SALT LLC wants to help people with uh, propulsion. Now, uh, I remember way back in the day, my interview with Stan Friedman talking about how he thinks um, many of the UFOs we see are um, programmed by magneto hydraulic propulsion. Um, well, I'm sure this be some of them are all are. There, it's a percentage factor of what some UFOs are powered by this, some are powered by that. But from a standpoint of getting um, to and from the different star systems in the in the cosmos, which are light years apart, 
that wouldn't serve any purpose or any good really it's only good for traveling around the uh, the earth once they're here um, so when it comes to propulsion technology you don't just have to propel you have to find a way to circumvent the um, speed of light and distance factor through, and you can do that through what the Bob Lazar technologies of um, Elman 115 or create wormholes or whatever or so just flat out um, the fact that space and time are illusions. Oh, you want to say something? Yes. Oh, sure. Sorry. I just wanted to say that with respect to what um, Mr. Friedman had said with respect to, you know, them using or whoever they may be, whether interdimensional, extra dimensional ET, future humans, past humans, or maybe all the above. Um, in, in, with respect to using a form of propulsion or switching to a form of propulsion when one gets into the atmosphere of a planet, I would in fact agree. Now, it would speak to this idea of me different mechanisms for different purposes. Uh, it's just kind of like when you're jump driving a car, jumping on the highway. You're, you're, you're driving very differently on the highway when you're going a certain speed than when you're just driving, you know, when you're just pulling out, out of the driveway of the house. So I would say very strongly and adamantly, uh, absolutely in that regard, a, a, a sort of a switching would be done. A switching mechanism within the craft uh, would, in fact, be done. Now, what's interesting, though, is that with respect to the craft themselves, and I will touch upon element 115, Bob Lazar, all that in, in a moment, um, is that it is what some of the consulting that I'm currently doing at SALT, and forgive me as I have to just sort of uh, watch my words here, uh, being under contract for some, some various groups, uh, it is indiscernible as to unless one is directly uh, unless the, unless the excuse me observing individual which speaks to the dual slit experiment in quantum physics is directly in front of the craft themselves it becomes indiscernible to know if that craft is for example an, an a, a craft of for example light or plasma if it is a more not if it is a if it entails a ceramic encasing as other people uh, during uh, who claim to work on legacy programs have uh, have so proclaimed. It is also indiscernible to tell if it is, in fact, perhaps what we would know as an advanced holographic simulation and something from outside of the planet's atmosphere or even another dimension or reality is controlling it. Sort of like reaching your hand into a, a, a cage of rats and the rats going, where's this hand coming from? We don't know. And then, you know, everyone's speculating. So in that regard, I would, in fact, say that, yes, um, I don't mean to get, check the all the above uh, option um, up, off. But the thing is, is that so far, some of the consulting that I've been doing to provide some of these answers and solutions for certain both private and federal in, uh, groups and interests, seem, that's where the data seems to lead. Uh, not necessarily my opinion, as much as it is just the data that I've been provided with to then work on and report back and consult and give my, you know, two cents, if you will, on. Now, at the same time, with respect to the element 115, I would say that, um, with Mr. Bob Lazar, I would actually very much agree with the way in which he described the gravity amplifying, uh, the gravity amplifiers, excuse me. Now, with respect to element 115 itself, I don't, I'm not for it, nor am I against it. What I, because I, I don't know anything about it. That is, truth be told, element 115 is not necessarily an area of interest for me, and it's not because I don't believe in it. It's simply because I've simply chosen another path in this area, if you will, to pursue. But what I can say is that I am of the very humble and strong opinion that everything Mr. Lazar claimed could be done with respect to anti-gravitic propulsion and things like this can be done without the use of, an, of uh, that type of element whatsoever. It, as a matter of fact, I would dare to say it's not so much what the, ele what the craft is made of in a material sense, so much as what one is doing to the craft itself. Um, I would dare to say, as a matter of fact, that in some cases one can go as far as to use um, certain things out of their kitchen uh, that would, in fact, induce the same phenomenon. So, uh, unfortunately, I got. I, I do want to say more, but I have to draw a line there. But um, and it's not to, not to debunk or to go against the Element 115 uh, story whatsoever. I just simply don't know about that. But what I do claim to know humbly is that one doesn't necessarily need element 115 or any element for that matter um to to create this or get this going based on my my spirit my experience and experiments in actually now i can say in closed laboratory settings uh, because since i had cracked it i had then been you know brought to certain laboratories and certain things were done and and you know proof of concept was more than substantiated so 
Thank you. Now let's um, talk about some of the uh, medical benefits here. Well, this is an area that it seems like every every time we try to make an advancement, something comes in to uh, shut it down. But hopefully, with the New World Order system being taken out more and more every day, all the medical benefits that the um, MDs who are trained to treat the symptoms and not the causes, thanks to the Rockefeller family and the Rockefeller Foundations, the um, MDs are not able to treat the causes of illnesses um, much, if at all. And, well, if they could, then all their patients wouldn't be coming back to see them all the time. So um, I guess that's the biggest problem with um, medical benefits. But what do I know? What do you know? I'll give you the chance to talk about what you know in regards to medical benefits. And one thing that's driving everybody crazy sure. for some people is the med bed thing. Like some people said they were supposed to have been released at this time. And the people that were asked, okay, you said we were going to be released at this time. Why weren't they released at this time? Um, well, the answer was, well, they were released, but not to everybody, just certain factions of society. Well, I'm sorry. I, I thought you meant they'd be released to everybody. Why weren't they? And so it's, people are kind of losing their patience with this. Um, so, uh, right, right. To say about well, that issue. one, one, one thing, sure, sure. One thing I can say is that by no means am I a medical doctor. I have in fact communicated with very high level doctors, um, medical doctors, um, uh, we could, you know, uh, brain scientists, uh, surgeons, uh, neurologists in which, you know, their work has been funded by whether, you know, DARPA, DITRA, the Air Force, uh, the Naval War College, you name it, in which, the this goes back to this concept of again the underlying energy that can be tapped can in fact be manipulated and perturbed for lack of a better term to then uh, be applied in a granular nano molecular sense to a cancer cell to then for example uh immediately sort of like stacking books atop one another replace that cancer cell with a healthy one uh, whether it's through, you know, people, they, they call it publicly quantum uh, enablement and things like this. Well, I get just as, I, I got, excuse me, just as frustrated as many others do when people say, well, this word quantum is being thrown around all the time, but we don't know what, it's so vague, you know. Well, some may say, and rightfully so, quantum means the smallest packet of information or, uh, you know, energy there is that can be, again, quote unquote, quantified uh, in a measurable scientific sense, whether medically or otherwise. Well, I would say absolutely, but that still doesn't define what the hell it means. And that goes back to the whole concept of, again, has there been some type of public stagnation in the medical field to give the illusion of progress while simultaneously creating a, a butchery uh, in, that, in the field? I would dare to say, to be honest with you, and one can call me crazy, but I would say absolutely. And the reason I'm so focused as well in that particular regard with respect to consciousness uh, which branches off into the medical area and, and propulsion, of course, is because, again, I think this also speaks to our ancestors with respect to ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, you name it, understanding that this same underlying energy, once adjusted in certain ways, can, whether alchemically or in a nuts and bolts sense, can, in fact, again, heal people, uh, pr uh, allow for propulsion, allow for, uh, you know, op tele forms of organic telekinesis uh, via that of, you know, what we would call the Schumann resonance of the earth. If we view the earth as a living, breathing body, and we are smaller, perhaps maybe fractalized versions of it, let's say, perhaps that type of substrate energetically could be tapped, things like this. And so I hear you when, when you say that, for example, you know, oh, the med beds are out there, but it's only for a select few. I hear you. And to tell you the truth, brother, that's actually why I'm doing what I'm doing with salt in an attempt to bring some of the cells while simultaneously, again, not getting disappeared. <laughs> so in other words, uh, forgive me if I've been running in circles here, but the reason I'm so passionate about this is because the same, whether theoretical equations or engineering apl um, application-based experiments used in propulsion with some adjustments and some conditional uh, um, perturbations met can in fact then go from being a uh, you know anti-gravity uh, cell or propulsion cell uh, or fuel cell to being a cancer perhaps cancer curing um, uh, you know treatment for someone it's the same and this is why I think as well and this is just a personal theory of mine we as a species humanity are a species rediscovering the same general understanding of such energies over and over again.
the question is how are we forgetting it so i could be wrong there as well but that's just that's just my take okay um at this point i uh thank you very much for that and at this point uh this is the part of the interview where i'm going to ask um this point in the interview on uh pay-per-view uh people that wish to listen to this please consider subscribing on patreon uh, I could use a few more subscribers, wouldn't hurt there, would love it very much, actually. Um, don't have as many as I want to have, so, uh, well, nobody ever has as many as they want to have, <laughs> but you get my drift. So, um, please consider subscribing to Patreon, folks, yep. to be able to listen to the rest of this, um, program. And with that said, um...